two other ecosystems in the Caribbean don't get enough credit and they are actually more impactful in our fight towards climate change than even mm-hmm. the entire uh, Amazon rainforest. Really? And those are seagrass beds and mangrove habitats. Oh, okay. So when I was in, in grad school is when I actually came across this is in 2015. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Wilson Grimes, she was our professor who introduced something called blue carbon. Have you ever okay. heard of blue carbon? Uh, no, that's the first time I'm hearing it. <laughs> so, well, great. <laughs> yeah. You guys are about to learn something new, man. <laughs> yeah. Learn something so, new every day, you know? That's, that's what we, yeah, that's what we out here, right? Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sound 1 4 podcast. Today, I have Colin here. Uh, he's a marine biologist. How's it going, Colin? How's it going? Great to meet you. Thank you for oh, having good, me. Good. Yeah, yeah, good. I, I'm. For those who, who are listening, like you probably think my voice is different, like because I'm a little bit sick right now, but it's it's all good. Um, yeah. So you're you're a marine biologist, and we I, I like the background there. You you have all the coral reef and everything. Yeah, this yeah. is in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Oh, okay. Yeah, and what what made you get into marine biology in the first place? Like, was it as a kid? You, you were fascinated by it or later down the road? You know, that's a great question. Uh, I really got into marine science, not because of one thing, but mm-hmm. because of a series of things, right? So both my parents are originally from the Caribbean. So my dad is from Trinidad and my mother's from Dominica, which is the part of the uh, Eastern Antilles in the Caribbean. And so as a child, we got a chance to go back as a family. And I remember snorkeling, you know, at yeah. like eight years old, seeing beautiful coral reefs. But then uh, as I got older, my parent, my father's in the Air Force, he's in the military. So we traveled Mm -hmm. a lot and we got a chance to travel to uh, Japan for about four years. And while we were in that part of the country, I got a chance to do my first ever DSD or discover scuba dive in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And, you know, that was just like. That was kind of what (laughs) (laughs) set it in place. Once you you see that, you're like, okay, this is crazy, you know. Cause we, oh, it was transformative. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For me, I, I haven't done uh, scuba diving, but I've done snorkeling in Hawaii and, and certain areas. And that's cool. gotten me uh, really fascinated with the ocean because for, for a long time, especially like as a kid, you're not really aware of it too much. Like, oh, it's, we go to the beach. I'm in California. We go to the beach. But then you see this documentaries and stuff and there's this whole world just this ecosystem of everything that lives down there that normally we don't get to see like every day. So it's really Indeed. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. How cold was it? You guys are snorkeling. Uh... Um, it, it was, it's pretty cold over here. I know in the Caribbean and stuff, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a lot warmer. And like, do you know why, why that is like the, the climate over here and in the Caribbean? What, sure. What makes absolutely. It, so you guys actually get a huge current that flows from like Alaska and the Arctic South along mm-hmm. your coast. And that's why the California coast ecosystem is very different from the West Coast. And it's because of that current where on the East Coast, our current is, you know, part of the Gulf Stream that heads from South to North. And so that is transporting huge amounts of warm water North yeah. and it goes to the, um, into the Arctic that way. And so that's why our ecosystems are a little bit different. Oh, okay. And does that affect, yeah, you mentioned the ecosystem is different. So is there, uh, the, the coral reefs, are they different? Like the different type of life forms that could handle uh, cold weather or cold waters better? So on your guys' coast, you do have some um, organisms that could be considered corals, but primarily you guys have kelp forests, Your waters are much more rich. There's more nutrients in it. So you get big megafauna. So you get sharks, you get um, seals and sea lions, Mm -hmm. right? You guys get otters. Um, So your ecosystems are actually very, are rich and diverse in their own unique way, but somewhat distinct from tropical coral reefs in the Caribbean. Yeah. So they're both highly productive ecosystems, right? Coral Mm -hmm. reefs and in your cold water environments. But the kind of foundational species that supports these ecosystems are different. So on the West Coast, there are these kelp forests, right, that can grow feet in a day. 
and create these huge canopies and that structure promotes uh, biodiversity. Yeah. And it's the same function that corals do in coral reef ecosystems. Mm -hmm. But in our ecosystems, corals prefer, prefer more warm waters, right? They prefer a very narrow range yeah. from about 25 degrees Celsius to about 28. Once you start going above that, uh, then that's when they start to get into some trouble. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Just that, that they're two different sides. Like they're both diverse, but in their own unique way, you know, like just one side has the coral reefs and then there's kelp on, on the West coast. So that's interesting. And also I wanted to ask you about the, like the water itself, when you go to the Caribbean or, or any tropical area, you, you look at the pictures, it's like perfectly clear and everything at white sand beaches and stuff. And then when you go come to California, it's kind of darker. Like the water itself is a lot darker. Do you know the reason for that? Yeah. So this cold Arctic water you guys get from the North is very nutrient rich. It's heavy. And it has a lot of oxygen in it. Uh, these are actually where you see a lot of these algae blooms that actually produce a majority of the oxygen that we breathe instead of, you know, people think it's rainforest, but it's actually these massive algae blooms in these highly productive regions. You see big whales and other megafauna that go up there to feed. This is why, you know, this really rich and just the abundance of fish is beyond. Yeah. Um. So, but when we are in the, I'm so sorry, can you say what you're asking the again? The water itself in in the ah. Caribbean and compare it to California? Yeah. So compared to the Caribbean, it's very crystal, crystal clear water. Mm -hmm. And in reality, and it's kind of what makes coral reefs really interesting, is that coral reefs actually exist in a desert. Because oh. these crystal clear, beautiful, vibrant waters are actually very nutrient poor compared to these nutrient rich waters on the West Coast and in these cold environments, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it, coral reefs actually are like an oasis in the middle of the desert, right? Oh, Where this clear yeah. crystal water has no nitrogen, it has no phosphorus, it has nothing really to promote life. Mm -hmm. And yet these corals create these vibrant ecosystems. And it's all because of this intricate relationship that they've been able to develop over millions of years with something called zooxanthellae or symbiodinaceae. So there's these tiny microscopic plants that live inside coral tissues that photosynthesize. Oh, okay. And it's this relationship that allows corals to, pro to survive in these uh, otherwise ocean deserts. It's yeah. crazy. So it's basically underwater plants, right? So the, the sunlight basically is food for corals. And that's why I think it's closer to the shallow water so that sunlight can come in, right? That's absolutely right. Yeah, they yeah. need, so it's interesting, they actually need this crystal clear water that uh, allows the sunlight to go through mm -hmm. and gives that to the algae so the algae will photosynthesize. And it's interesting, corals are actually animals, and so they're actually heterotrophs. They actually can catch and eat prey. Oh, really? Most people don't. Oh, yeah. Wow. Corals, if you look at the small polyps, they're related to jellyfish, right? Mm -hmm. And they have little polyps with tentacles. They have stinging tentacles on the end of those. And yeah. they will actually catch and try to eat animals floating in the water column, mm -hmm. right? But that only provides about 20% of the food and the nutrients that they need to survive. Yeah. The remaining 80% comes from this relationship with their symbiotic DCA. Okay. And I know you're, uh, you're a specialist in, in coral reefs and you study it. What, what, is the, what are the type of research that you're doing currently or that you've done that you, you'd like to share? Oh, yeah. So let's see. I've been really lucky to participate in a couple of studies throughout the Caribbean, looking at a variety of things. I'm very lucky to have a couple of publications where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, our research was peer reviewed by other scientists and it's published in the scientific journal. And one of the first was studying diver impacts on coral reefs on a small tropical island called Bonaire. It's okay a part of the Dutch Antilles next to Aruba and Curaçao. It's about 70 miles north of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a very popular dive destination. They get thousands of divers every year because it is one of the most beautiful, yeah. healthiest ecosystems in the Caribbean. I mean, 
still today, it's like one of the best coral reefs that you can see. Really? Is it and a protected area? It yeah. is actually very protected. Okay. Yes. The yeah. local government. So there's something called Stanapa, which is their local agency that will patrol the waters. There's certain regulations. And they actually have a very effective and brilliant strategy for funding and supporting this kind of, of, of um, zone, this protection. Mm-hmm. Fly in because they have so much traffic. If you want to go snorkeling or diving, you need to buy a little token and you put it on okay. your mask or you keep it with you. It's like 10 bucks. And that yeah. 10 bucks is for the year. So it's cheap. You know, you can mm-hmm. go in the water as much as you want. But that actually funds the local community to protect their ecosystem, to, mm-hmm. you know, have people go out and patrol the boats. There's no spearfishing allowed. And so there's certain protections that actually maintain this vibrant and amazing ecosystem. Yeah. So, and they're generating, you know, thousands, millions of dollars every year as dive tours come down to dive these yeah. remote and beautiful reefs. Mm-hmm. So, sorry. So the research was, you know, we get a lot of divers and it's very easy to dive there. They're, each dive site is outlined by a bright yellow rock okay. and that's kind of the start of the dive center so you can park your car on the side of the street and then walk right in put your tank on you swim maybe 10 meters offshore and then boom there's a the reef mm-hmm. right so when i uh the lead on this the pi his name was dr patrick lyons and uh we worked on his team to assess the structure of these coral reefs right so it's called rugosity the three-dimensional okay. structure of each coral reef. And we, we quantified that and tried to understand, is there a lower structure right at the start of these dive sites compared to about 200 meters out? Is this dive traffic having an impact on the structural complexity of these coral reefs? Because okay. the structural complexity is really important. That provides mm-hmm. the habitat that makes coral reefs thrive. And so that was one of the studies that we looked at. That was back in... Uh, I think it was published in 2015. Okay. That, and did it impact the, did, did he find any, the conclusive results? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, when you, it is just due to the nature of the diving in this area, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people have cameras or they're new to diving and inevitably it was just a sheer number of divers that enter yeah. in a particular spot on that, on that coastline. Mm-hmm the corals in that immediate air are going to get nicked and bumped and touched and stuff like that. Yeah. And so, and, and over time, right, it will slowly break down this structure. Yeah. And so one thing that we can take away from this is maybe not always diving right there mm-hmm. instead of like spreading out those, the, those yeah. divers along the coast. And so you're not impacting these immediate one specific areas. Area. Yeah, exactly. Right. And talking about scuba diving, uh, I've personally never scuba dived, uh, but I, I plan to in the future. Uh, Good, yes. Yeah. And for you, what, what's the, what's the best part about it? Just going under, what, what do you feel? You know, when I first started diving, I have to be honest with you. I was absolutely terrified. Yeah. <laughs> terrified. Terrible. I got... <laughs> <laughs> I got certified as in a rock quarry. I'd actually encourage, that's great to hear that you're interested mm-hmm. in diving. We yeah. want to try to encourage more young people to think about scuba diving and coral reefs and stuff like that because it's um, absolutely awesome. Yeah. I got certified in this cold rock quarry in Virginia with a couple really? of my buddies from college. And then the first time I went diving in like an actual ocean mm-hmm. outside of, you know, Australia, where I was certified was in Belize at a study abroad um, class that I was taking while I was in college. Yeah. And we out on the boat and it's crystal clear. You can see the bottom, right? Yeah. And it's like 50 feet <laughs> and I roll off the back, I hit the water and you just immediately realize how small you are Yeah, just in that vast open space floating, you know, the surface, mm-hmm. you're seeing all the fish and it freaked. And then, so like, and my friends will tell this story. They'll laugh at me because Mm-hmm. The first time we hop in, there was a remora. This is a you know kind of specialized fish that prefers to hang out with other pelagic. So you see them on sharks, whale sharks. You see them on whales, sea turtles, things like this. Yeah. And they have these suction cups. They like to like suction onto you. Mm-hmm. And it came straight at me, bro. <laughs> and when I saw that, I kicked at it. You know, I kicked at it with my fin, and it juked yeah. and came at me again, and I freaked <laughs> and I screamed in my regulator. It was bubbles. 
Yeah. And my friends, like, you know, I'll never live that down. But <laughs> that was my first experience scuba diving. Uh-huh. After a while, though, and you get more comfortable with it and you start to recognize what's down there, you recognize that coral or you recognize that fish, you recognize mm-hmm. the environment you're in, it becomes a second home to you. And yeah. it becomes second nature where you can spend hours underwater mm-hmm. and not get bored. Yeah. Because, yeah, I just imagine it to be such a different experience because we're so used to just seeing water like on top of being on top of water. But once you go down, it's it's like a whole different world. That's just we we really don't experience that much. And I think probably the the biggest thing is just you see how big it is. Right. Especially if you go in the ocean, you, you look down like you could see just dark water going for <laughs> miles and miles, you know, just go. And as we know, like there's more water in, on the earth, there's more oceans than land. So it's crazy how, how big it actually is and, and everything that lives in there. And, and we, I think we still haven't found everything there is in the ocean. We still haven't discovered the, like the entire ocean. There's still parts, uh, still not touched by man at all you're correct Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that's that's crazy and i also wanted to talk to you about the the climate impact on on all these oceans like we talked about the protected areas of of the coral reef or or of certain areas that are protected and i i saw a documentary recently showing the the waters that are protected they're abundant with life and everything is basically, you know, thriving in that area. And just because we have literally left it alone and have just let them do their thing, it has thrived. And when you look at other areas where people are fishing, heavily fishing with nets and just overfishing, uh, it has led to a decline in, in everything. And that that ha- might have uh, led to some climate impact as well, right? The the coral reefs, I'm not sure if I say this correctly, but the coral reefs actually like help with uh, keeping the balance of our climate. I'm not sure if that's correct, but. 100%. Uh So it's interesting. We are now, you know, science is evolving. And a lot of what you said is so on the, is like on the right track. You're absolutely Mm -hmm. right. Looking at how we can protect these areas and it's remarkable how resilient and how effective coral reefs are, right? Yeah. And, you know, transitioning to climate and thinking about this relationship to it, we are highly dependent on these ecosystems for survival. Yeah. Right. Whether it is for food, whether it is for coastline and shoreline protection, Mm -hmm. whether it's for tourism and income. Right. But and so when we're thinking about these tropical marine ecosystems, they're really critical. Now, to your point about how their ability to kind of maintain and control or or, uh, mitigate climate change. Yeah. Coral reefs do have uh, impact because they're highly productive places, right? So Mm -hmm. they produce a lot of biomass and these animals are consuming and producing things. But two other ecosystems in the Caribbean don't get enough credit and they are actually more impactful in our fight towards climate change than even mm-hmm. the entire uh, Amazon rainforest. Really? And those are seagrass beds and mangrove habitats. Oh, okay. So when I was in, in grad school is when I actually came across this is in 2015. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Wilson Grimes, she was our professor who introduced something called blue carbon. Have you ever okay. heard of blue carbon? Uh, no, that's the first time I'm hearing it. <laughs> so, well, great. <laughs> yeah. You guys are about to learn something new, man. <laughs> yeah. Learn something so, new every day, you know? That's, that's what we, yeah, that's what we out here, right? Yeah. Yep. Blue carbon, these two ecosystems per square foot, right? Mm-hmm. Sequester more carbon out of the atmosphere than rainforest. So wow. when you go out to the Florida Keys and there are miles and miles of seagrass meadows out there, mm-hmm. these seagrass communities are actually pulling a lot of carbon out of the water and they're trapping it inside the soil and in their roots and in these sediments, right? Yeah. And I've actually been to, when you go to some seagrass communities, they're so rich and so vibrant and they're so productive. They're they're photosynthesizing and doing all this work. 
that you can actually see small oxygen bubbles release from the seagrass communities, right? Yeah. Really, really rich. Mm -hmm. And that carbon is trapped underwater. And that's the critical difference between marine and terrestrial ecosystems. On terrestrial ecosystems, right, we understand that trees and rainforests sequester a lot of carbon, and this is true. However, when those leaves, you know, so trees will grow, and in those leaves, there are carbon in that, and they'll fall to the ground. Mm -hmm. They'll break down and turn to soil, and that's how you sequester carbon into the soil that way. Mm -hmm. When these leaves break down, they actually release small amounts of CO2. Compared to mangroves, on the other hand, where half submerged underwater, they do the same thing. They're growing, they're pulling carbon into their tissues and they're growing into the actual structures. And mangroves actually as a way to survive salt water, they put out a lot of leaves and they put salt in a few of these leaves and they'll turn yellow and they'll fall back into the water. And this actually has is more efficient at trapping carbon than terrestrial ecosystems because mm-hmm. once it drops underwater, that extra CO2 that's released is trapped in the water. Does, does and this, the extra sorry to cut you off, but does the extra CO2 affect the water at all, like the, the oceans? Yes, mm-hmm. it does. That is another aspect of uh, climate change and our need to stop using fossil fuels. A majority, or I think it's like 30% of the carbon that is released into the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean, right? Wow. Yeah. And that leads to something called ocean acidification that makes it difficult for majority of marine life that build calcium carbon skeletons or, you know, use calcium carbon in their, Mm -hmm. in their um, bodies to form shells and stuff is going to be diminished. But so long story short, these two ecosystems, mangroves and seagrasses actually do a much more efficient and better job at pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. And so it's something that we need to think about. And if anyone is interested in studying these ecosystems and learning more about them, these are going to be places that actually can help us Mm -hmm. fight climate change, protecting seagrass beds, making sure that people who drive boats don't, you know, cut up the seagrass, making sure we're not clearing mangroves for, you know, million dollar mansions and things like this are going to be able to help us become more resilient in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause uh, as we, as we know, like the, the climate, uh, the CO2 has, has increased and, and it has impacted everything you know, not just on land, but also in the water. But yeah, just, I I did, that's interesting though, that I never thought of it as like mangroves and seagrass are actually more efficient at, you know, capturing this carbon and actually making a a difference. Um, And, and just like the, the, the coral coral reefs itself, like what, what do you think uh, is is the most critical part of the coral reef that keeps it healthy in general. There's a lot. There's mm-hmm. a lot. So I guess the best way to sum it up is, and like as a metric to, for us on how to understand how healthy coral reefs are, is diversity. Okay. Yeah. How diverse these ecosystems, that's really where coral reefs uh, come to shine because Having really diverse ecosystems is very resilient in the face of uh, environmental threats or, you know, shifting climates. Yeah. Having, you know, multiple species that have their own unique traits that are able to withstand certain, you know, conditions, whether it's increased temperature or it's diseases Mm -hmm. or, you know, what have you. uh, That's why coral reefs are really critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the diversity, I, I... I mentioned the documentary I saw and and one of the things they mentioned was the the bleaching effect that uh some coral reefs are experiencing especially I know the Great Barrier Reef has experienced in in some portions can you explain why that happens to some coral reefs Sure yeah so this phenomenon is really a message from the environment mm-hmm. you know corals are basically the care, the canary in a coal mine that sea level temperatures are, are sea, sea temperatures are rising. Okay. Yeah. And so we talked about earlier, this intimate relationship between corals and their, their symbiotic algae, right? Zoosanthalia or symbiodinaceae. 
this relationship is really productive and really efficient at capturing the sunlight to produce energy, right? And this kind of builds and thrives coral reef ecosystems. Yeah. However, as sea level, uh, sea temperatures start to rise, this relationship between corals and algae starts to break down. There's actually some biochemistry involved, and I'm not very too familiar with all of this, but basically it becomes the, the symbiotic algae actually can damage coral tissue. Mm. And so they're stressed. Corals basically become stressed. They're not comfortable. They're not ideal. And as a response to this increasing in temperature, they release all of these algae out into the water column. This is kind of like their final ditch effort to try to save their lives, right? Mm -hmm. Because remember, these algae produce the majority of energy that they need. They cannot produce enough energy by themselves to yeah. survive for very long. Because of the photosynthesis they need that, that creates the energy for them to survive, right? Correct. Correct. And so this is what happens when you have coral bleaching. And unfortunately, you know, corals have been around for 250 million years, right? Yeah. They've, and, and the corals that we see today are the result of millions and millions of years of evolution. Mm -hmm. And these corals are able to, with, to really thrive within a very narrow temperature range between mm -hmm. like, you know, let's say like 24, 25 degrees Celsius to about 28. Anything above that and you start to see lower growth rates, lower physiological responses in these things, and that kind of relationship breaks down. Okay. And as, you know, there, this is just an other example that, yes, indeed, our climate is changing. Mm -hmm. Our seas are warming, and corals bleaching is telling us, hey, these waters are getting too warm. Yeah. Something is happening in our environment, and we're warning you, this is, hey, like, this is what, we're, this is what happens when things get too hot. And so yeah. this is a message that is being sent around the world from every single coral reef that is experiencing bleaching. Mm -hmm. And the Great Barrier Reef is, has gotten a lot of attention because it is the largest barrier reef chain in the world. I mean, you can yeah. literally see it from space. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it's like 1,600 kilometers, uh -huh. right? And it's the largest. And then you have the Mesoamerican Reef, which is about like 600 miles, and that's between Central America from Mexico down to Panama. Wow. And then you have the Florida Keys Reef tract, which is like 330 miles from like northern Miami all the way down to the Dry Tortugas, and that's the third largest barrier reef in the world. Yeah. So these ecosystems are Vital. telling us something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned the the evolution of coral, coral reefs uh 250 million years, right? Is that correct? That's, yeah. That's insane. And ha have you looked at the, the evolution? Like what has changed? Because I know the environment has changed a lot in 250 million years. You know, there's been the ice age and, you know, the world itself has changed with or without humans really having an impact um, just through natural causes. And what kind of difference has that made just looking back how have they ab adapted in in those times as well? Yeah, so you know, I'm not too familiar with the evolutionary physiology aspects of corals. Mm -hmm. That's some heavy. That's some yeah, heavy yeah, science. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually slowly learning a little bit about that now in my PhD. But one of the examples that I can come up with is this relationship with their algae. Right? Mm -hmm. Think about that. Like, imagine if you were able to eat plants because that's exactly you know they have a small yeah, yeah. mouth and they ingest these plants and then in their cells their cells can recognize like oh this is an algae that we want mm -hmm. and it creates this symbiosome is what it's called it's an organelle it's a membrane bound organelle inside the actual coral cell where wow. the symbiodinium lives mm -hmm. And in between this barrier and this is some active area of research I was actually talking to a really interesting professor who is who studies this the barrier between the actual animal cell and the plant cell and the proteins and what they're talking together about and then like the, what uh materials they go give back and forth because corals actually provide these plants things like nitrogen and phosphorus from their waste and carbon dioxide that these plants need to use to photosynthesize so this relationship between corals and their algae have evolved over millions of years yeah become very efficient mm -hmm. and really specified. And that's why, you know, 
one of the areas of research that they've looked into uh, is when uh, algae photosynthesize, they produce these kind of radioactive oxygen species, ROAs. Yeah. And these kinds of compounds are really detrimental. They can actually break down coral tissue. Mm -hmm. And corals have developed certain proteins and certain biological responses to kind of combat these impacts, right? Yeah. Now, when temperature rises, proteins actually function based on their shape, right? Mm -hmm. And when temperatures rise, these shapes can kind of morph and change, and it can limit coral's ability to combat these uh, ROAs. And so these are one of the examples where they believe this relationship starts to break down, right? Okay. And as a result of rising sea level, uh, rising sea temperatures. Yeah. So it it has... Uh, a more significant impact because the proteins change because of the of the right of the CO two emissions and stuff. Yeah, and that's just one. You know, like I don't know. I'm not. I don't know a lot of uh, about everything, but that's mm-hmm. one aspect. There are a bunch of different interactions that occur uh, between corals, and so that's something that has indeed evolved for a long time, and yeah. is something really cool to study. Yeah, because that's that's interesting. Because I I look at it and I know about not too much about our the difference in climate over the past millions of years, but I know about the ice age and stuff like that. So I'm, I was curious about just why, how, if it's been around that long, what are, what were some of the differences? And it's probably something that, that ha, has been, is going to continue to be researched on and, and learn more about, but it's, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. There are a lot of, there is research into that kind of, um, historical relationships, and you you can compare it to jellyfish, right? Mm-hmm. Evolutionarily, jellyfish yeah. are much older than corals, right? They've been around for what five hundred million years, insane. Wow. Yeah. And corals actually evolved from this, and so they're actually closely related. Uh, and so, seeing differences between corals and jellyfish, for example, can can give you some more insights about their physiology. You know, jelly don't have, uh, you know, the skeletons or any of these structures, right? But then. They haven't been changed for millions and millions of years. They've they kind of figured it out already. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How to survive? <laughs> yeah, they could already do it. Uh, the something I wanted to ask you was since you know a, a lot about, you have a lot of knowledge about the ocean, and if, if you can be put in a position of power where, let's say, you could put uh, certain areas, you could put protected, you could you have the authority to make it a protected area. No matter what, like you could do anything with the ocean, it's under your control. What would you do to make a, a difference? Yeah, so this is something that I think is extremely important, and that science is slowly starting to recognize and do first. Mm-hmm. But I would talk to the communities that live along these coasts, the indigenous and black people, people of color that have built a relationship with these communities for millions, for you know, thousands of years. Yeah, that relationship. And how best to make it more consistent, mm-hmm. right? I've seen a lot, you know, in the Caribbean, there are a lot of, of, of hardworking and people that want to go down there and they, they study these places and they want to try to communicate and in that change and say, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And that is not very well received yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by what, you telling know, somebody what they should do and not especially do. if you've lived there your whole life and somebody, you know, comes down and yeah. it's like, oh, I have this PhD and I know this. Uh, and so therefore you should listen to me. I don't, you know, mm-hmm. that's ineffective. Yeah. So first I would talk in, to these communities to try to understand their relationship with the ocean, where we could try to promote and encourage an idea that coral reefs for these tropical islands, especially in the Caribbean, Mm -hmm. is a renewable resource. You can generate millions of dollars every year if you have healthy and vibrant coral reefs, right? And so, you know, really trying to sell that message and saying, hey, your economy can be based on coral reefs and mangroves and seagrass communities, right? Mm -hmm. They're talking about a global carbon tax, right? So like countries that actually, you know, have these ecosystems can receive money and funding to protect and to increase these ecosystems, right? So they can do a better job of pulling carbon out of the environment. Mm -hmm. I would talk to these communities and then, of course, establish a basic understanding of where and when and what to catch, 
right? Yeah. Based on seasonality, incorporate the skill sets that we already have. You know, marine science has really expanded and taken off. Mm-hmm. And we already have the tools and the understanding and the knowledge on how to enact real change and to protect coral reefs. And yeah. back to, you know, what you mentioned earlier, coral reefs are indeed very resilient. If you mm-hmm. leave it alone, they will yeah, come back. They will come Fish back. will start to, exactly, you know, mm-hmm. corals are actually very resilient. If you give them a chance, if you give them a break, right? Yeah. <laughs> no more coral diseases, no more, you know, let's try to cut down on our carbon emissions. Mm-hmm. And so that we're not getting severe hurricanes every single year. Yeah. Let's try to cut back on our pollution and plastic use entering in the ocean. So that, you know, that exacerbates microbial activity in the water column and actually can lead to pathogens, yeah. right? There are so many things that we can do. So I would talk to the community about establishing a relationship with their ocean. And then I would try to encourage them to try to say, hey, the more healthier and productive your ecosystems are, the more money you can make. Because yeah. it's true. Mm-hmm. If you're yeah. a scuba diver, you know, you're a young scuba diver and you're interested mm-hmm. about seeing would you want to see vibrant, beautiful coral reefs with millions of different corals and species there? Yeah. Or would you want to see something that's like half alive yeah. and, you know, doesn't have any big fish, mm-hmm. right? Like there's value in having a healthy and vibrant ecosystem. And so yeah. I would definitely have some no-go zones or not. That's not the right term. So it's called, you know, marine protected areas. Yeah. Areas that have a certain set of rules that people must follow in these areas. And one of the greatest examples of this that is taking place is in the Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. There's this real big push to, to, it's called the seven iconic reef. And so this is based on research. So long-term data, long-term monitoring data has looked at all the different reefs in the Florida Keys. And they've identified specific reefs that are the most vital for the remainder of the Florida Keys, basically. Mm. And so there's a bunch of different agencies from the state, from local government. Um, there's like nonprofit universities are collaborating together to regrow corals. So they're doing a lot of coral restoration work that's out there. They're trying to limit the amount of fishing um, and boat traffic that's out there, sunscreen use, these kinds of things. Yeah. And what you said is true. Once you allow these places to thrive and to be vibrant and to protect it, mm-hmm. they not only, you know, grow in their population, but they actually spill over. Yeah. And they can actually uh, seed other reefs. And mm-hmm. so that once we're able to establish this kind of relationship with coral reefs and marine ecosystems, we yeah. can do it. We can actually make them uh, sustainable. Yeah. It, it, right now, just kind of it. it, it made a comparison to me like farming you know we as farmers they don't just keep planting in the same region and and try to get the most out of the land every single season right they they let the the soil rest for a little bit and it rejuvenates the nutrients that it needs and Indeed. i think that's same with the uh, the coral reefs they need time to you know and also just the the organisms that live there the the fish and everything they need time to just regroup and everything before, you know, humans, like they take all the fish and everything. So they need that time of regrouping. And also I think once you, you let the, the, the cycle take place, not only will it be enough just for the coral reef, but it might be an abundance of where there's so many fish that there, you don't need a fish so many times every year there's there's an abundance of it already right indeed so, absolutely yeah mm-hmm. yeah so that that's that's pretty interesting and and like you you mentioned it's it's good to see that the florida keys right they're they're already trying to implement some of the 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 science basically that that's provided they're they're trying to implement some of it and hopefully it'll it'll make a difference and continue to other other countries and other areas We'll also try to implement it as well, and hopefully it'll, it'll come back. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now I talk about the keys because that's what I know most. Right, mm-hmm. there are countless agencies and organizations around the world and in the Caribbean doing things like this. Yeah. Right, we are doing this. You may not see it on the five o'clock news, yeah. but there are communities that 
will be directly impacted by climate change. Let's be real. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we're going to have to do something about this. Yep. And so, you know, places like the Florida Keys that produce billions of dollars, right? Yeah. Their lobster fisheries alone in the Florida Keys is billions of dollars. Wow. And yeah. so this is real money. You know, mm -hmm. people, you know, there was a, I used to live on a small island in Leighton, uh, in the Keys called Leighton. Mm -hmm. and uh, on the south side, closer to like marathon area, there's these like big homes. Yeah. And there was a plot of land. It was just sand, but it was on the beach, right? Mm -hmm. And I was walking and I went to go and check out and see the price of that. And it was like $700,000 just for sand. Wow. <laughs> just, just the property no value. No home, yeah. just the sand, uh -huh. $700,000. And so when we're thinking about climate change and we're thinking about these ecosystems, yeah, we want to make sure they're protected because this is billions of dollars, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And, and when, when people realize that it, if uh, we do it sustainably, right? Like everything we, we do, we could like lobster fishing and all that. We, if we do it sustainably, not only will we not have to worry about climate change as much or the, the fishing aspect of it and all the, the economics of it, it can all be done in this cycle that's that helps everybody, not just us in, in general, right? Indeed, yeah. indeed. And it starts with talking to people. It mm -hmm. starts with talking to these communities who have built a long lasting relationship and a livelihood. I have my good friend here, Forever Young, his name is Anthony Young, okay. and he runs a charter company in the Keys and his business is directly tied to coral reef ecosystems. Yeah. And he actually does a great job. Him. So uh, one of the uh, something else that I'm sure people are curious about is lionfish. Have you ever heard about like the lionfish invasion in the Keys? I, I, yeah, I think that they're overpopulating, right? The area. Yeah, indeed. Think, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an invasive species from the Indo-Pacific and it came to the, into the Caribbean. And from like the early 1980s until about 2016, mm -hmm. invaded the entire Caribbean peninsula, like wow. region. Damn. From North Carolina all the way down to Brazil, you can find wow. these invasive lionfish, right? Crazy. Mm -hmm. People that live in the Keys, including my friend, they go out and participate in lionfish derbies, which is okay. you and your boys. <laughs> you get like four people. But the women out there too, you know, there's some, there's some yeah, deadly yeah. Uh, women spearfishers out there. And your job is to kill as many lionfish as possible. Oh, okay. I know, it's, and there's like no, no limit, really? Just No. Damn. Yeah. And I mean, well, because so, and then that's important. I know. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason why, right? There's a reason why we are trying to encourage this kind of behavior. Yeah. Lionfish are a venomous species that was invasive. It's originally from the Indo-Pacific in the Red Sea, mm -hmm. brought to the U.S. typically through the aquarium trade. They're beautiful, colorful fish. Yeah. I think I've bright. seen it in the aquarium. There. Yeah. Yeah. They're very popular aquarium fish mm -hmm. and they have 18 venomous spines, 13 on the dorsal, on the, along the dorsal. They have two on the pectoral fins and then three on the anal fins. Right. Okay. And they grow and reproduce rapidly. Mm. Females, if the, the conditions are right, females would produce 30,000 eggs every four to five days. Wow. <laughs> and so these eggs, actually, they've been some research that these egg bundles actually have a deterrent that makes it taste bad. So things don't eat it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're fatty. So they float up into the water column. Right. And so in the early 80s, they actually started seeing reports of lionfish up along the east coast of the U.S. So like North Carolina, Maryland and even New Jersey, yeah. although they die back in the winter months. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it got into the Bahamas and then traveled through currents based on this reproductive nature throughout the entire Caribbean region. Yeah. You can find lionfish in about a thousand feet. People were in submarines and they saw lionfish on these deep sea, like, sh like shipwrecks and weird things. And wow. you can also find them in like two feet of water in the mangroves. Wow. There's some controversial research, uh, about, not controversial in a sense, but there's some research about lionfish actually can survive like low salinity environments, which is like mm -hmm. <laughs> insane. Yeah, that's, that's and so insane. scientists have basically come to the conclusion, like, we cannot eradicate lionfish anymore. Uh -huh. They are too well established. They are too widespread. And from now on in the Caribbean, we have to manage this species rather than eradicate it. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is that we're at. It's just, just yeah, it's gone to that caveat. point. It's gone much. to that point. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what, and so these lionfish, 
their negative impact is that they eat a lot of the small juvenile fish that we like to eat. So mm. small fish that recruit to coral reefs like groupers and snappers and jacks, lionfish are eating a lot of these. And there's been a lot of research that looks at how lionfish impact these juvenile reef fish populations no matter where they are. Mm-hmm. Voracious predators. There actually was a study that some lionfish showed fatty liver disease. They are gluttonous. They just eat, right? Wow. And so they're decimating fish populations, Mm -hmm. right? This is the threat. Yeah. NAR predators haven't evolved to recognize them. And so predators don't respond or don't recognize lionfish as food. So Mm -hmm. you're not going to go out and see like, uh, you know, um, tiger sharks or sharks or or, um, moray eels or anything going out and eating lionfish. There's a dangerous... Avenue people have gone trying to feed big grouper and big sharks and, and more eels, lionfish, which I personally don't think is a good idea because these big predators are not going to recognize, oh, I should eat lionfish on my own. They're going to yeah. recognize, ooh, scuba divers and snorkelers have food. Yeah. And that's just going to, that's not ideal. Mm-hmm. But the best also, way that we can, you know. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, the, you mentioned there are no natural predators uh, currently, but were there in the area that you mentioned uh, where they were brought from, were there natural predators in that area? Yes. There were? Okay. There are, there are pressures out there. So there's predators, there's actually parasites, and there's more competition. Mm. Coral reefs in the Indo-Pacific and the Philippines in that area is the richest in terms of species and diversity. It's unreal. Like, yeah several times more diverse in the Caribbean. And that many species is really competitive, right? So Mm -hmm. that ecosystem, you have to be very specialized. And so lionfish in those regions have certain controls that keep their population in check. Mm -hmm. When you introduce it to the Caribbean, these kind of controls are not there. Not there. Okay. And so the best control is us. We are ironically very good at (laughs) (laughs) removing (laughs) fish from the ocean. And so one of the management protocols, one of the management approaches to this is lionfish derbies and you know yeah. these guys go out and they'll pull thousands of lionfish out every single summer wow just and that's crazy. we're actually trying to encourage people to eat lionfish we're actually trying to develop a new fisheries mm-hmm. and so give other fisheries a break so like really popular fish like grouper and snapper and mahi mahi that get are really popular and, and get eaten a lot yeah if you introduce a new uh, like choice in the menu Mm -hmm. that can have an impact and so there's a concerted effort in the keys to try to shift the population's perspective on eating lionfish there's like cookbooks some restaurants in the keys will actually eat it and in some parts in florida Mm -hmm. and so this is this kind of like beautiful collaborative effort to try to enact change and to try to protect coral reef ecosystems in the caribbean yeah because if one thing just gets out of balance then everything gets out of balance really and so it's it's important to manage all that and and see that that every every species thrives in its own right and so yeah um i think we'll we'll wrap it up there this was a great conversation colin i appreciate you taking the time to do this and my uh, pleasure yeah yeah continue what you're doing man i like your podcasts Mm -hmm. and having different ideas and perspectives share their opinions that's really great and i'm thankful for for you reaching out and uh Hopefully you can stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again. And, and thank you everybody for watching, listening, and uh, talk to you guys later.